Secret things belong to the Lord our God, and those things that are revealed belong to us and our children forever. Welcome to Full Stature Ministries, Secrets Revealed. I'm Dennis. And I'm Dr. Jen. Now, today's program is part two of Renewed and Remolded by God. And that comes out of a verse, Colossians 3, 9 through 10, in the Amplified Translation. And that says, You have stripped off the old unregenerate self with its evil practices and have clothed yourself with the new spiritual self, which is ever in the process of being renewed and remolded. And of course, God does, does that to the whole person, 1 Thessalonians 5.23, where Paul prays that um, believers will be renewed and remolded spirit, soul, and body. Well, good. We have, we have Pastor Vicki here who's been remolded and remade several times, and she's going to share how that all happened. Now, Vicki, um, you were on the mission field in Ecuador uh, for many years, and you'd had some training before you went there. Could you please tell us some of that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, uh, my husband at that time was a pilot, and after our training, uh, we went to Ecuador to uh, work as a support as support missionaries to our translators because we were with Wycliffe Bible Translators, and um, so we had to go through a, a period of training. Uh, one of the part of the training that we went through was linguistics, just learning how uh, what our translators do, and, and we took many courses in how to how they actually uh, take an unwritten language and write it. And then we went to Mexico where we actually lived in the jungle. We learned how to live off the land and uh, to um, do things like kill chickens and give shots and uh, how to uh, go down the rapids in a canoe without falling out, uh, different things like that. So, and we learned, we lived with a, an Indian family and uh, we lived in a mud hut. We built a mud stove. So we did a lot of things just to learn how to live in the jungle. Tell about um, the night. Y'all were all separated into different individual mm -hmm. places, mm -hmm. and you had to do a shelter and make a, a, a bed. Mm -hmm. And um, right, yeah, we at one point, uh, any any at any time, we could be taken for uh, what we call survival hike, and we would just be taken at any given time during any day. So we always had to have our uh, water and our machete with us. And so uh, on this particular day, we were taken out to uh, a place in the jungle where we had to build a bed. And we had been taught how to do that out of twigs so that you were off the ground, how to build a fire, um, how to find something to eat when you didn't have anything. And so uh, we learned to do that. And uh, it was very interesting. Now, how did you start a fire? Um, you know, I'm not sure I remember. <laughs> Did you? I mean, you didn't have a fire starter that you could no. just click. No. Oh no, no, no. Uh, I don't. Uh, we had. Um, uh, I had my machete, and we had some wood, some dry wood. And at any rate, I had a very good fire going. And the girl next to me, we were all separated, so we were all in our own little doing our own little thing mm -hmm. all by ourselves. But <clears throat> I couldn't get my bed made. But I had a very good fire going. So the girl next to me, she got her bed made, but she couldn't get a fire going. So we got together and we camped around my fire all night so that we could stay free of any animals that were out mm -hmm. there. We could hear, you know, the wild animals out in the jungle. Right. That must have been, mm, it would have been nerve wracking a little bit yeah. for me. Yeah. So um, I consider that, it roughing it just. Yeah. Well, it was roughing it, that's for sure. But, you know, God uh, was very good to us. And, um, you know, you never know what you can do until you have to right, do it. So. Right. Now, one night, uh, to bring in a funny story, you could hear a sound of chip, 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 chip all through the night. Can you tell oh, us what that was? Oh, that was my husband. When they took him out on a survival hike, we all had to chop down, you know, our wood for fire and uh, to make our beds and everything. And, and uh, people, the other people in the 
survival at the survival hike that were camping there kept hearing this chop, 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 chop most of the night. And so the next day, uh, what happened was uh, my husband had his machete, but when he was chopping wood, it broke. To only have, he only had about this much of a machete, <laughs> and he was trying to chop wood. And so we all, we've laughed about that over the years. Um, you know, he, he did manage to, to get a few pieces of wood, but um, it took him a long time. So. Now, you were, you were in several locations, but tell us about Ecuador. That was uh, it's interesting history attached to that part of the country. Yeah, um, Ecuador is a small country, a beautiful country, uh, but we were actually located out in what is called Oriente, which is the jungle region. And um, uh, because uh, most of the language groups that we worked with were out in the, the Oriente, and we had a small... Um, well, you might call it a compound. It was a center where we had an airstrip, and there were about 15 families that lived there. Um, we we had, um, I mean, we had all the amenities of living here in the states. I had hot, cold, wa uh, running water. I had, sort of. I sort had, of. <laughs> you must admit it was sort well, of. Well, sort of. We had to do everything <laughs> from scratch. There wasn't any. We had a commissary, but. When you walked inside, there was nothing there. <laughs> Anything that was there was in a box and closed up to keep the bugs out. And um, so, you know, it was just, uh, you had to learn different ways of, of uh, living. You know, you didn't open the refrigerator a lot because the electricity went off at 9 o'clock at night. And so, uh, you didn't, after 9, you didn't open the refrigerator, things like that. Um, so it was... It was a, an interesting lifestyle. It was really a paradise in many ways because we had a school there. Um, we had, you know, all of our land was cleared, so uh, but we could, you know, we could hear the animals in the jungle. And I, we were right next to what the uh, group of Indians called the Quechua, and we lived right next to them. And um, so it was, uh, you know, we had what we needed, and it was a good life. Now, before you came, a number of years before, there had been a situation in this area with other missionaries and the Alka Indians. Could you tell us about that? Okay. But when uh, we went to Ecuador in 1974, and but in the early or the middle 50s is when uh, the five missionaries, many have heard about that incident where the five missionaries were killed. Nate Saint and you know, all the other uh, missionaries were killed by the Alka Indians when they were trying to reach them for the, go uh, for the gospel. Um, out of all of that, um, Nate Saint's sister, Rachel Saint, lived among the Alkas her whole life, and she was a good friend of ours. Mm -hmm. And Dayuma is one who had come out from the Alkas and actually taught Dayuma how to, uh, to speak the language. And so Dayuma, I mean, uh, Rachel stayed in the, the village uh, with the Alcas her whole life. There were other people who worked and did the translation mm -hmm. for the Alcas, but um, Rachel was well known because she was Nate Saint's sister. Right. And um, so we, we flew for the Alcas. We did a, you know, a lot of things for them. I've had them in my home many times and for meals. And um, many of them have come to know the Lord and they have their own church. They have uh, the written word of God in their own language now. Now, back when the incident happened, the five missionary men had been dropping down a bucket and lowering it mm -hmm. and leaving uh, little gifts mm -hmm. for the Alcas who'd never been reached by somebody from the outside world. That's now, right. the Alcas had a full revenge based society mm -hmm. and it was. And if they'd kept on, they probably would have killed everybody before it was all over. Mm -hmm. And so these Christians were coming to bring a different message, mm -hmm. a, a message of Jesus, mm -hmm. the Savior, the, the one who had forgiven them of their sins to people who were the, living the opposite of forgiveness. Right. And what happened then, after these five men were martyred on um, a sandbar right there off the river. Mm -hmm. What won their hearts? What did the wives do, the five wives and, and sister do? Okay, well, um, they forgave. 
the Alcas. And uh, Elizabeth Elliott went and lived with the Alcas for the, the following year, and that's when Rachel came in and began to um, make headway with the Alcas through Diuma. And uh, it's a long story, and but but the the essential thing was forgiveness. And they were so astounded that these women would come to them and say, "We forgive you for killing." my husband, I forgive you for killing my husband. And Rachel was, I forgive you for killing my brother. Mm -hmm. And that that message just melted their heart. You see, I think more and more we're going to have to get to understand that when we talk about the love message of Jesus, that we need to get that love message where the rubber meets the road. And in reality, it's forgiveness. Forgiveness being lived out is a love message. It's, we talk about tough love. That is tough love. It's, it's allowing them to see something that they've never seen before. They had In a revenge society, they have no place to put that. Mm -hmm. And, it, and it, it, love will take you back, but it has to be tough love, not gushy, uh, mushy love but basically the kind that takes backbone, the kind that takes making a, making a hard decision to, to, uh, to release something to them, a kindness to them that they know they didn't deserve. Mm -hmm. So there was, there was probably no place to, for them to put that. So that would get grasp their attention. Yeah. We, we had uh, taken Vicki when she came back to the States to the theater to see that, the, movie, the end of the spear, the end of the spear the which story. was a remake of uh, Gates of Splendor. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. And Vicky was sobbing, and I'm going, "Oh, this is very sad." But she's she's really overreacting. And then I found out later she knew those people. That wasn't a movie to Vicky. She lived with them, and then that really took me back. Especially seeing that little girl that ran away in the movie. She had a choice of what. Being killed, by being killed, and plus, didn't they teach you that the white people are cannibals and they'll eat you? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it was either be killed by the enemy, her, her, if you her, stay. Except those weren't her enemy; those were her relatives and yeah. family and tribe. So and <laughs> stay and be killed, or run and be eaten, mm -hmm. was the two choices, and so she just happened to run. Mm -hmm. And then Vicky says, "That was my friend." We spent time together. So that, that uh, I think Vicky was cut out for the mission yeah. field because, oh, swam with the piranhas. Oh, well, we stayed close to the platform. To the platform. And, and there are crocodiles <laughs> in there, too. Yeah, but they, they're farther away. Like, if I can see them, that's close. <laughs> if I can make eye contact, that's close. I never saw one in the daytime. They usually were more prevalent. You could see, you know, because they would go out, take the boats out at night mm -hmm. and shine a light so they could catch the babies. They did that for tourists, you know, just oh. to, that was our entertainment. <laughs> we didn't have television. <laughs> we didn't have television. So you entertained the tourists, like, but probably that, scared them. But that radical act of forgiveness actually made what you did and others were able to do in that area possible because that was the opening. And then um, many of the Alcas, and they like to be called the Wairani, which yeah, means the people, the, Alka means savage. That's their real name, mm -hmm. Wairani. Mm -hmm. And so you worked with many of them. Now, there was one man in particular. Who did he kill? Did he kill Nate Sam? Who did Nikai. he kill? I've, I'm not sure which one right offhand killed. which one he killed, but he was one of the killers. Mm -hmm. And um, he came to know the Lord um, and has, you know, been faithful to the Lord all these years. Uh, our last trip back to Ecuador, uh, well, we, had, we were living there in another town, and we went back and actually visited with him and had banana drink with him. So um, that was a long time ago now. <laughs> So a lot of things have happened since then, but uh, there's, there is a group of believers there. Mm -hmm. Well, um, when we were in Ecuador, before we ever went to Ecuador, uh, when we first got married, we both, had, for some reason, I felt like the Lord had put the desire in our heart. We always wanted to adopt. And we went to language school in Costa Rica. We were there nearly a year, and the people we were, we were living with a Costa Rican family, and 
they tried to get us to adopt and I just kept seeing a stop sign and the Lord kept saying, no, it's not time. And so once we arrived in Ecuador, um, I really began to pray about it. And we had been there um, a year, I think, when um, this little girl came there. Her name was Gloria. She was there with her dad, her sister and brother. And um, her dad was there because he was ill. He was sick. And uh, eventually they went back to their tribal location, which at that time was quite isolated. We didn't have an airstrip there, so we didn't know. They didn't have a radio, so we didn't know what had become of Gloria. But probably a year later, um, an airstrip was uh, made there. The Indians came out, they made an airstrip, and my husband was the first one to land there. And this little girl named Gloria met him at the airplane and took his hand, and they went through the village. And um, so Danny came back home that evening, and he said, well, guess who I saw today? And I said, who? And he said, Gloria. And so we had not seen her in quite a while. We didn't really know what had happened to her. But during that time, her dad had passed away. And so uh, it's a long story, but many things I had asked, several things I had asked of the Lord, and he met each one of those criteria so that I knew that Gloria was the one we were supposed to adopt, and my husband did too. So we started making, doing, going through the process of getting to know her, getting to know us, and us getting to know her, writing a letter to the Kofans to ask them if we could have her, and so forth and so on. And at the end of all that, uh, we adopted her. And then a year later, um, we put our name into an orphanage there in Quito. Uh, and we had told the Lord that because of our situation and being ready to go on furlough at a certain time, we said, if we don't hear by August the 1st, we're going to withdraw our name from the orphanage. And on August the 1st, which happened to be on a Wednesday, I believe, we, we uh, had a radio message that we had a, a new, how did the radio put it? They couldn't say exactly what, what, we, what it was on the radio, but that there was somebody we needed to come up and see and I had to get a name for this person. <laughs> and so um, that was on August the 1st. So we went the next day and picked Daniel up. So he was a newborn. And so within a year, we had our two children. Now, Gloria's tribe was a very small tribe. She's probably the only one that ever left. She's the only one who was ever adopted out of the tribe. Her uh, great aunt has been to the States uh, for medical reasons, but, um, there has never been another person other than Gloria who's been adopted out of that, that tribe. There were probably only about 700 Kofans at that time. And since that time, I think they've increased in number greatly. But at that time, they were a small group of people. So tell us about how you discovered us in this faraway country called well, America. And what was, I, I would like to, um, for you to share a little bit about what your emotional and spiritual condition was and and then how you discovered us. Anybody, okay. I mean, Anybody that swims with the piranhas mm -hmm. got to be a little bit stable. Are Were you? Well, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so far as those kinds of things, that was not a concern of mine. But, um, you know, growing up, I think emotionally I was never very stable, but I didn't know it because um, I had all the outward appearance of being stable and, uh, and being normal. And I mean, I was normal, but I, I know there was a lot of hurts and things in my life that, and I grew up, in fact, um, now that I'm free of it, I think I grew up mostly depressed, not realizing that not everybody felt that way. And so, because there was a kind of a depression, you know, that right. would plague me at times. And not until I was free of it did I realize, oh, this is there's another way to live. So you were back in the States, mm -hmm. and you heard about our church. Yeah. Well, I had actually been going to a church for a long time, and a friend of mine invited me to uh, your church. And I said, well, I'll come. She said, well, it's a really good church. I said, sure, I'll come on a Sunday night. So I went uh, on a Sunday night, and um, the first time I went, I the anointing was so wonderful that I just thought I've got to come back. And so I came back the next week. And I think that on the next week, I think it's when Dennis asked for a volunteer to pray for. 
and I had no idea what he was going to do, but I went up, I volunteered, <laughs> and so I came up, and he prayed for me. And at that time, this was much later, this is like in 2003, um, I had been going through a, a divorce, and so my life, my whole world had been turned upside down. And um, Dennis prayed for me through an issue, healing concerning the divorce, and it was just so wonderful. I mean, I just remember feeling, wow, this is so good. And that, I mean, that was wonderful, but even the first time I went, I thought, there's a gold mine here. If people don't, if, if I don't, I need to get everything there is to get here because when people find out what Dennis and Jennifer teach, they're going to be pushing the door down to get in. And um, I want to be one of the first. And so I started coming then. And uh, I came every Sunday night until I actually switched from where I was going and, and came full time. And then decided that wasn't enough. And moved in with you. So. <laughs> That's right. And she said, everybody ought to live with Dennis yeah, and Jennifer. Say, we went, no, no. Yeah, used <laughs> to say, everybody ought to come and live with Dennis and Jennifer and, <laughs> and be mentored and discipled because um, it is, it was a gold mine and it was like uh, something I had never experienced before. And I had been in a lot of churches, you know, from the time I was 11, you know, I had been in church. And uh, as a missionary, you know, I've gone through Bible college, but as a missionary, we really didn't get a lot of spiritual food other than what we gave to ourselves. And um, then I, we came back in 1995 and went to, I found a wonderful church. And I was just, you know, really um, so happy to, to have found a place where I was being fed. But when I came to your church, it was, it was like, now I know how to apply all the things I've learned all my life. You know, I read the scripture, and I can remember in college, we, I used to go up front every time they'd have rededication. I was always up there. But when I came back to my seat in the following days, I was still the same person. I wasn't changed. And I thought, how do, how do, you, how do you ever make it happen? Can I, I tell a favorite story? I don't know. She doesn't know if she wants <laughs> me to tell the story. <laughs> we put her through the 60-day challenge because I said this worked for Jennifer. So in, in the morning, uh, she had a mother-in-law apartment where my mom and dad used to live downstairs. And we would meet downstairs for our prayer time, and the three of us would pray together. And Jennifer and I would be soaking, and I would see Vicky kind of go like this. And we knew she was crying. And I'd go, Vicky, are you okay? She goes, yes. And then one day she just kind of snapped at us away. Don't you people have any issues? <laughs> Don't you have anything? I said, yeah, but we have. We, we, we prayed through ours. We prayed through ours. And eventually she got there too, to where prayer was more communing with God. And if an issue surfaces, fine. But it should be 99% enjoying Him. And uh, eventually 1% dealing with your issues. Because actually, you can get proficient enough that you learn to deal with your issues in the moment-by-moment -moment relationship, even on the job, at work, in the home, in school, whatever, is you learn to process. But I thought it was interesting that what uh, Vicki learned and saw so indicative of life transformation on the mission field was the message of forgiveness. And then she comes to the one church that basically says that until you forgive from the heart, from the heart, right. and that we want to help all of the wounded people who are sincere, and I, I don't, you can't emphasize that enough, but sincerely doing, giving it mental assent and mm -hmm. struggling with the pain and the sorrow when there's no need to struggle. Mm -hmm. Jesus takes your pain and your sorrow every single time. Well, I can remember growing up, I had, I knew forgiveness was important, and I always, I would make a decision to forgive. But I always had the pain, and I never mm -hmm. knew how to get rid of it. And I do remember on one occasion when there was something I was really struggling with, and the Lord sovereignly did a work in me so that I was totally free from that. But I never knew how to do it again. I right. never knew how to get back there. Right, right. That was my struggle in Christianity, too. If I ever did anything right, I didn't know what I had done to get a result, and I didn't know how to, to duplicate it. So that was my experience. So... Of course, you were thrilled to learn the how-tos, but 
I was thrilled to learn the how-tos, but you're taking it further than that because we're all about now how do we get it out to, to people? How do we teach people? And so you're part of our uh, one of our prayer coaches that works with people and takes them through the steps and teaches them how to yourself. Plus you actually teach our material as well. Mm -hmm. So what does that mean to you as far as helping other people? Well, it's wonderful to have something to give. And it's like Dennis says many times, until you've heard something or, or received something, you don't have anything to give. Or, and uh, I was broken emotionally growing up. And um, even as a young, you know, an adult on the mission field, it wasn't something that people could see, but it was on the inside. That's a good point. Yeah. It, mm -hmm. People would never have thought that necessarily, uh, but, but I was. And, and, but I, what I have found since coming to this church and this ministry is that God has cleaned me up and it's like there's a rock, there's a firm foundation there that wasn't there before. Because I, I not only have the how-tos, I know how to apply them, and I know how, and I can help other people, and I know that I can. People have a lot of hang-ups about forgiveness and what forgiveness is. And in, uh, in the, the people that I deal with on a daily basis, that, uh, that's what I see. They don't understand what forgiveness really is. And um, they think if they sometimes if they forgive, it lets these other people off the hook or condones what yeah, they condones did as being did. okay. Mm -hmm. That's the big hang up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When you release forgiveness to someone from the heart, like the Bible says, basically they no longer are emotionally controlling you. You're the one that's really free. You release them and honoring God by forgiving, but you are the one that's actually freed from being controlled by the torment, the hurt, the pain. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, that's, the, that's the beauty of the, of the whole message. But uh, I'm grateful because our pastors walk in a forgiveness lifestyle, every one of them. It's not a message, it's not uh, just forgiveness. It's the love message where the rubber meets the road and it's being practiced and we're seeing it on a regular basis. And I believe that uh, many people's lives are going to be changed as a result. Amen. But God's passion is for heaven to be on earth through you. Living in God's presence is the only way we can truly live free. Secrets revealed.